Hello, museum friends! It's Nat here at the Roberson Museum and Science Center today, and we are going to talk trains, uh, early transportation, uh, and local Binghamton history, and a little bit of Bristol history too. So, actually, Broome County history. Um, and we are specifically ooh, gonna turn the camera around here real quick. We are going to be also exploring this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful model train exhibit. But even more special is we're not gonna stay behind the glass. We're gonna go behind the scenes, so I'm gonna duck to go behind the scenes here. You can watch me crawl through the space. Very lovely. Um, and we're gonna go behind the scenes into the model train room. So excuse me while I <laughs> Thank you, yes, very entertaining. Yes, so we are here behind the scenes in the model train room. So, so rare look at this huge, oh my goodness, huge, huge, huge exhibition of all these different sites from, from Binghamton and Vestal and Owego. Look at these little details. This is amazing, and this is all volunteer, volunteer made, volunteer run from our train, our train guys. We like to tell them our, our train guys, our volunteers, who all work on upkeeping this beautiful exhibition. Yeah, welcome guys, welcome, welcome. Yeah, that work on upkeeping this beautiful exhibition. So I want to talk about some of the mini sites um, and share some local history with y'all. Um, and specifically, we're gonna start out by talking about, sorry, it's behind the scenes, so you might see a little bit of a mess. Um, but yeah, so we're in, here's, here's a familiar site. You might notice this near Remlix on uh, Lewis Street. This is the Lackawanna train station. And this is all stuff that's based around, I wanna say the 1950s in Binghamton. Um, but I wanna talk about first how transportation helped Binghamton grow and helped us grow in Broome County. So transportation in the form of bridges, waterways, rails, and roads all help us get to where we wanna go and all help us grow, help us find places, help us transport materials. Um, and Binghamton is no different. So it was settled in the 1800s and it started growing at a nice clip. It's, it's, uh, it's a relation to the Shenango um, and Susquehanna rivers definitely helped in that. But what really helped, um, it was incorporated into a village. So it had thousands of people living here. Yes, very wonderful. Um, had thousands of people living here and it was incorporated into a village in 1834 and around that time it was decided to construct a, um, a canal so the Shenango Canal and it ran through where present-day State Street is pretty cool like eh? oh and there's Roberson Mansion eh, cute Roberson Mansion right there um, so, and this, and the canal helped us connect to northern Utica, which helped us connect to the Erie Canal, which is uh, the canal that I learned about when growing up, 15 miles on the Erie Canal, low bridge, everybody down. Yes, and that is my, that is my singing voice. Um, so that's the, that's the canal I grew up with, but here in Binghamton, um, you probably learned about the Shenango Canal. And the Shenango Canal, helped bring in commerce, helped bring in businessmen, helped develop this area, which is really cool, develop this area because uh, canal travel was a lot cheaper and connected to a lot of the different waterways. The only unfortunate part about a canal is that it can only be used during certain times of the year. So here in upstate New York, um, it gets quite cold, things start to freeze over, so canal travel isn't uh, as great year round. But then trains started to develop and they can run 12 months out of the year. Um, and they can go to different places that don't rely on waterways, that don't rely on a river. 
um, or being in proximity to a river. So that's also great. And so trains started to develop here. Um, around, 18, around the 1850s, trains started to make their way through Broome County and they were built here. Um, and probably not so coincidentally, Binghamton was incorporated into a city, which means it had more than 10,000 people here. That's pretty great. And the trajectory went up and up and up of people um, deciding to settle and um, grow their businesses here. So Ro Mr. Roberson, Alonzo Roberson, grew his business, turned his father's lumber mill into an international business um, through the trains and took advantage of those. Um, but here, I want to kind of say, like, yeah, that's the Lackawanna train station right there, Lackawanna train station. But um, I want to talk a little bit about how trains expanded and specifically trains in this region expanded um, through some very interesting advertising. So I'm going to zoom in on the train right here that says Lackawanna. And you can see right here, right there, it says Phoebe Snow. Now, Phoebe Snow is a really interesting character in the development and expansion of the, the Lackawanna-Delaware train line. Um, so there was a, an advertising scheme that was developed that featured the character Phoebe Snow. And she had some special songs that she liked to sing, talking about how she rode the rails of anthracite and her white dress would stay clean from Buffalo um, to Hoboken, New Jersey on, on her travels. And that's significant, her wearing a white dress. So uh, train travel was not the cleanest travel. Um, it was, uh, you'd end up rather ashen, your clothes rather ashen after you traveled um, because of the, the cinders. Um, but anthracite coal, which from this region and the Pennsylvania region um, was special. It burned hotter and it burned cleaner. Um, and the, the saying went, it took the sin out of cinders. So people could go from point A to point B if they rode an anthracite train, which was the Lackawanna Delaware train. And Phoebe Snow promoted that specific line. And so more, it it, it encouraged more people to ride that line, which is pretty cool. Um, unfortunately, Phoebe had to retire um, from uh, her job promoting the Lackawanna Delaware because World War I was starting up and anthracite coal was needed for the war effort. But Phoebe Snow um, was revitalized, her name was revitalized uh, as, a, as a train line that came through Binghamton a specific train line, which was rather nice. So anyone who, re who would remember that time could say, ah, I remember Phoebe Snow. Um, but yes, the, unfortunately, train lines had to retire um, through Binghamton around, I think the last Phoebe Snow train that came through Binghamton was 1966. Um, and it came through the uh, Lackawanna train station right over here because uh, highways were starting to take over, um, rails couldn't get enough funding to continue, and some lines had to discontinue, unfortunately. So last train through the Lackawanna station. And it's a good thing that we still have this train station as a marker. It's, it's absolutely beautiful. It has, a, it has some lovely, lovely small businesses working to, working out of it. Another uh, interesting site I wanna showcase here is, and you might recognize this pagoda style, it's the Vestal Museum, but it used to be a train station. Oh, look at that, that nice pagoda style. And so I wanna, I wanna talk about a story involving this Vestal station. Well, not this one in particular, it was built after um, this particular incident that I'm about to share. So you might be going out onto the Vestal Rail Trail lately be to get some sun, get outside a little bit, and you may have come across a sign that reads, site of 1901 Lackawanna train wreck, two freight trains collided, five tons of dynamite exploded, causing a loud roar, great ruin, and killing five railroad men. So I wanna talk a little bit about that story. 
um, and expand upon uh, that marker that you may have read um, and kind of said, what? What, what happened aside from a great explosion? Um, so the story behind the Vestal train wreck, which happened on that site where that marker stands, um, is yes, uh, two freight trains collided, um, but the expanded story about that is, um, so there was a train that was coming from Pennsylvania, made a stop in Binghamton, uh, and they were arranging their freights. So they were exchanging uh, cars for, for new freight and dropping off freight. And during that time when they were rearranging the cars, a cart full of dynamite um, unfortunately made its way from the center of the train in the car line where it was insulated from impact towards the end right next to the caboose unfortunately, not safe. It's uncertain who approved that configura configuration. It wasn't regulation standard. Um, there are different accounts that we have that say, oh, they, this guy approved it and said it was okay, it was fine. Um, but it was late, they were running behind. They didn't take into account into the schedule the very steep hills. And they had to make an unscheduled stop at the Vestal station to refill water. Uh, these are steam engines. These are steam engines we're talking about now. Um, so they had to refill at the Vestal station for more water. And so they stopped. And it's one job of one of these uh, train operators to get out from the caboose and walk a distance to set down uh, things called torpedoes. Now, torpedoes not as in the submarine torpedoes. Um, torpedoes as in they are uh, packets of explosives that are not meant to harm, um, but they ex make an explosion upon impact when another train runs over them to make a loud enough bang such that an oncoming train hears the sound and starts to stop. That's a signal for an oncoming train to stop and slow down. There's another train ahead. Unfortunately, um, the man who was supposed to lay down those torpedoes uh, had started his walk. And as he's starting his walk to get far enough away from the train to lay down the torpedoes, he sees another train, lights coming around the bend. Oh no, he gets out his lantern. He starts flashing. Um, this is a wildcat train that's coming. It's a train, so a wildcat train receives instructions at this time, going station to station, receiving new instructions to go different places. Um, so it doesn't have a set schedule. Um, it picks up instructions as it goes along. So this wildcat train is coming around the bend and um, it's, uh, it does not see the lantern light, apparently. The guy sees the train pass. It's not slowing down. The wildcat train isn't slowing down. Um, this uh, man named, by the name of Mr. Paul Hammes uh, claims that he didn't see anybody um, in, I guess, the driver's seat. Um, so he, uh, and from the point of view of the wildcat train, apparently one of the drivers went back to go get some tea for a minute. Uh, he came back and saw the lights of the caboose coming closer. Um, and he pulled the brake and jumped out of the train and there was a huge explosion. Apparently, um, people up to 70 miles away felt the vibrations from this explosion. It was massive. Um, yes, and it killed five people. Um, quite a few of them were related, all part of the Paul Hamas family. Um, and yeah, so that marker stands there as a memorial to that great accident. Um, people were thrown out of their beds because the explosion was so large, I think five miles out. Um, yes, it was, it was quite something. Oh, uh, Helmut says, the Vestal Museum has two HO scale static dioramas of, oh, oh, interesting. And one of the, oh, yes, please. Yes, yes, yes. Please go see it. Yes. Um, so yeah, so that is the Vestal Station. And the last thing I want to talk about here 
is about how ch how trains or how the railroad change time. So you may be aware, or may not be, that um, trains standardize time. Um, Eastern Standard Time, Central Standard Time, and so on. Um, but what you may not know is that it was quite controversial at the time when, when the railroad men got together and implemented this standard railroad time. So um, back in the day, in uh, the, in, I guess time was different from local lo, uh, local and regional locations. So it was dictated by somebody going out, looking up at the sun, seeing where it was in the sky, and saying, okay, that, yeah, that's, that's high noon right there. So towns that were just a few miles away would have ta clocks that differed by minutes. Um, not great for trains who probably are running on a tight schedule and need to know when trains are going to be there and departing. Um, so the railroad men got together and standardized time, making it uh, different from region to region. People were kind of upset. Um, so there started to become two different standards of time. There was railroad standard time and local time. Um, and throughout 18, I want to say 1883 to 1915, you can find various state Supreme Courts uh, that have cases brought to them arguing about, um, I guess, the ethics uh, of the standard time. There was a little bit of regional pride, I think, intermixed with a little bit of um, uh, arguments about how God should be the one to decide time and that they were trying to supersede him. Um, so yes, the, rather interesting, state Supreme Court's uh, arguments about uh, time <laughs> and the standardization of time. Um, but that's my last story for today. But before I leave you off, I'm gonna take you on a last tour of this beautiful model train exhibition. And once again, this is all volunteer made. Um, and it's quite big. It's, it's one of the biggest model train exhibitions that I've seen. And I want to leave you off and say that we are also raising money this Giving Tuesday for kids uh, that may not have a stable internet connection and who may not be able to sign on to, to edu educational classes online. So we're raising money to make packets for kids at home. So if you go to roberson.org, um, slash support or just go to roberson.org. We're raising money to create educational packets for kids um, and to make sure that they, they get uh, um, those educational packets. Yeah, 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 yeah. These, these model trains are beautiful. Um, but yes, yeah, so we're, we're making these packets for kids as part of G Giving Tuesday to try and do our part and to help um, kids who, who may not be able to, to have that internet connection um, and join those online classes as frequently as they, as they probably should. We don't, we don't want kids left behind. So please, 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 please consider going to roberson.org, making a donation. $20 um, pays for packets for 10 kids. And we're, all, we're assembling them ourselves. We're creating these educational materials. Um, to help support Binghamton and Broome County kids. Um, so if you can help us out, that would be great as part of Giving Tuesday. But yes, finish off taking this really lovely tour of this train exhibit. And as always, please stay safe, and we hope to see you at the museum soon. But until then, stay safe um, and enjoy these wonderful sights and, and beautiful recreations of these regions. Oh, this is one of my favorites, the viaduct of the region here. Yeah. So great, great job by our train guys um, for building this and huge thanks to them. Um, and I hope you all are staying safe and I will see you next Tuesday until we can see each other again at the museum. So bye.